So um, let me start by talking about some of the kinds of lesions that we uh, perform intraoperative stents. Now, you heard a very nice lecture just before me on the um, stenting of the ductus in the hypoplastic left heart. Uh, so I won't talk much about that. But I'm going to focus most, mostly on what's highlighted in yellow, pulmonary artery stenosis. I know there's another lecture on pulmonary vein stenosis, so I'll leave that alone. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about coarctation and why that might be helpful uh, with the intraoperative stent. And then an uh, unusual um, situation, uh, mostly in double outlets with a, a big VSD that becomes restrictive, uh, where we actually um, uh, create or enlarge a VSD uh, using stents. Uh, and, and then um, I'm going to leave the melody valve alone for now. So what's the background? Why do we need to do intraoperative ballooning and stenting? Well, we know that uh, intraoperative stenting uh, is well established. Uh, the patients where surgery is necessary to correct additional defects, um, it may be advantage to just uh, use that same opportunity to uh, perform the uh, ballooning or stenting. And it may be more advantage in doing two separate procedures, one in the catheter and one in the operating room. Certainly, it's more direct. It's technically much easier. Um, for the early post-op uh, procedures with the stenosis, it's safer because you can control bleeding if that happens. Uh, it takes a lot less time. Uh, there's no need for large, uh, no worry to use large sheets and delivery systems. Um, you can easily retrieve it or reposition it if you're in, uh, not in perfect position. And then stents can be also shaped to fit the anatomy of the specific patient. So. Uh, the intra, uh, now, intraoperative stents may have also certain advantages over, over the surgical repair. So you might ask, well, why don't we just do it surgically if you're going to do that in, if you're in the operating room anyway? So well, surgery have, on the long segment stenosis uh, can be difficult, time consuming, and oftentimes can have suboptimal results, especially in the pulmonary arteries. The, on the reoperations, uh, dissection can be a big problem, especially when you go outside of the heart where you worry about the phrenic nerve. Uh, there's less risk to bleeding. Um, and then vascular compressions or kinks, no matter how good of a patch you put in, if it bends, it's going to be a problem. So you might need some support, and the stents can offer that, especially with their dilated aortic in front or if there's an angle that's created, especially from the MPA to the branch pulmonary arteries. Actually, intraoperative stenting is not a new concept. This was first uh, reported in 1993 by Mendelssohn. This is in the University of Michigan. Basically, they talked about intraoperative stenting uh, at that time. Now, if, it, if you look at the paper, they talk about the indications being small patients, difficult anatomy, or adjunctive surgery. They were all implanted using direct vision on bypass. They didn't really talk about um, any advantages of over routine percutaneous approach. Given the the last decade with the improvement in, in technology, uh, with the smaller size delivery system, new stents, and just operator experience, many of those patients that were done in the operating room for that specific reason can now be done in the cath lab. So um, even though many of these um, no longer meet the indications to go to the operating room, you can do them in the cath lab, there are still some situations we find there's an advantage. I'm going to talk about them. So patients who have, who has to have surgery for additional surgery, such as a homograph change out or Glen or Fontaine, if you're there, you might take advantage of the open chest to put the stent in for whatever reason. I'll show you some examples of that. Certainly when there's a high risk lesion, such as early post-optive stenosis, you might worry about rupture. And doing it in the operating room can add a lot of safety to it. In the small patients, I actually put those as a relative indication. Depending on the experience of the operator, some may be more comfortable taking a smaller child to stent. But if you're not, if you're not comfortable with that, doing it in the operating room may offer an advantage. Uh, again, that's relative depending on the institution and the experience of the interventionist and the surgeon. Certainly in very difficult anatomy, um, such as bilateral proximal stenosis where one stent can jail the other and you have to do simultaneous in a small kid, that can be very difficult. Or multiple vessels or pulmonary veins where you have to do a transeptal puncture uh, can be a problem. And certainly in the smaller kids where the vessels are a little small, you can customize your stent to fit the anatomy in the operating room. I'll show you examples of that. Here's an example of a truncus repair. You see after surgery, the RV pressure is 114, so it's 
it's clearly bilateral stenosis. You can almost see that in the angiogram. We took the kid to the cath lab to see this severe regurgitation. So when you do the angulated shots, you see how there's a severe stenosis here measuring 1.6 millimeters, very big distally, approximately 2.2 millimeters. These are big problems. So we ballooned them in the cath lab knowing that I could not get a stent in on a small ba baby at that time. You see that there's a lot of recoil here. Yes, we improved it, but not enough. So um, we know that we have to do more than that. Uh, see how tight that is. If you do the Ocado view, you see how there's a, a very stenos a tight stenosis on both. Again, these are kissing orifices. Putting a stent in one side can jail the other one. So in this particular situation, the surgeons and I, we talked about is that maybe we should do this in the, in the operating room. So you can see how, you can see the orifice very easily. Uh, we put a stent in, mount on a balloon. Uh, the surgeons are actually p positioning this because they're right in front of the table. They see exactly where the the stenosis is very proximal. You don't need uh, angiography for this. And you see how the stent is being positioned here. And with the balloon inflated, you see the edge of the stent at the proximal site. And then here's the stent edge after the balloon has been removed. So it went from 1.6 millimeter to 6.5 millimeters. It's important not to do too much dissection because you can cause rupture. So we try to uh, talk the surgeons into minimizing the, uh, the dissection at that time just to get the stent in first. Because you want the, uh, the, the, the scar tissue to be part of these the wall to prevent it from rupturing. So then we go to the other side, you see that here's the orifice on the other side. The stent is again mounted on a balloon and you see how we can position the balloon with the edge of the stent right here and at the end you see this. And of course, the surgeons put in a new conduit there because of the uh, regurgitation. You can see the, the big difference. At the end of it, we can actually put a needle in there and do an intraoperative angiogram, see, it, uh, see the, um, the, 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 um, the results of that. Again, you can see in the, in the, in the C-arm, without a hybrid catheter or the cath lab, the angiograms are not as beautiful, but it's what we got so far, unless you have a hybrid lab. Now, what's nice about this is that you can position your stent so that the stents can offer an opening to both sides. You can see how there are two orifices, they're touching each other. You can put a catheter this way or that way in the future when you go back to the cath lab to uh, further do interventions. Here is the pressure in the beginning. We improved it to 86% after the initial angioplasty and after we did the hybrid, and you see the measurements, the RV pressure has dropped down to 46% systemic. So we know that this was an effective way of treating that branch stenosis. And of course, you go on in the future to further the dilate and when the child gets older. Now this is a very severe stunt. Now imagine this uh, kind of a trunk is trying to repair this surgically can be quite a challenge, I believe. This is a re-op. Uh, trying to take care of this in the cath lab is also quite a challenge. The function is not very good. So when you put a stiff wire sheath in TRPI, the baby is not going to handle this very well. So you can see how in this situation, uh, this is a six French catheter, so this is two millimeters at best. And it also goes up into the upper and low lobe, so quite very, uh, very difficult. Same thing on the other side, uh, very tight stenosis on the other side as well. So in fact, the, 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 the length of the stenosis is so small that you cannot take a standard stent that you can put in. So in this case, we actually tailored the stent. So we took a 1910 XD, we actually cut it so that three of these uh, is equal to a 10 and a half millimeters, one is about seven millimeters, and we actually mounted this on two balloons. One is gonna go to the upper lobe, the other is gonna go to the lower lobe. It would be very difficult to do this in a small baby in the cath lab. But in the operating room, one wire can be positioned in the upper lobe, the other can go to the lower lobe. So you can imagine the picture that we took in the cath lab. The one wire would go to the upper lobe, the other would go to the lower lobe. And in doing so, the stent is not gonna jail one lobe or the other lobe. It's gonna stay in front of it. And of course, you see the length of this is gonna fit just the size of the uh, that vessel before it, so that it doesn't protrude into the MPA. So of course, you see that after we did that, uh, we then uh, inflate the balloon. So you see the double balloon inflating one stent. And then later on, we actually went and ballooned the distal branches. In fact, we actually put two more stents into the upper lobe and lower lobe in the operating room. So you see how this is the shortened cut tailored stent and then two additional stents to the upper lobe and the lower lobe here. And if you look at the other side, we actually did the same thing on the other side, using the shorter half of the stent and then two additional stents. So you see how this is the picture in the x-ray. I magnify that for you. You see how this is the proximal cut stent to, to uh, match the proximal uh, uh, L RPA, and then two other stents into the upper and lower lobe. And here's the main branch of the LPA, and then two additional stents. 
And of course, this patient comes back in follow-up. You see now, we're able to now put double ballooning in, in there. We open up both sides in this case, and this is what it looks like afterwards. Now, rem remember how big that was before. It was tiny, it's the size of the catheter. So here's the before picture, and here's the after picture. This patient did wonderful afterwards. You can imagine that both surgery alone or cath alone cannot be done this is only, the best way to do this is collaborate with the surgeons so that you can come up with this plan to do this. So we've learned how to do this and work with our surgeons to, to, for these very unusual cases. Now there are two ways of doing this. One is at, um, uh, by direct vision, but there's another way. You don't have to, you do a stenotomy, but you don't have to open the heart. The heart is beating, it's not on bypass. You basically put a sheath into the MPA or whatever you want, take your pictures, and then use the angiograms to, uh, to do this um, positioning. That way you don't have to waste time on bypass. And there's an advantage to that too. Of course, it's nice to have a hybrid lab, which most of us don't have. Uh, we're building one now, but up until now, we, everything was done using a portable C-arm. So you see how the, the surgeon, this is just an example of one of the earlier days when I tried to convince the surgeons to do this in the, uh, with a beating heart, and he says, no, I can position it based on my visualization. So the so surgeon placed this, thinking that he had a very good position. But let me show you what it looks like after we took the kid, after they took the picture. Uh, you notice that he jailed the upper lobe, and it's too far in. Again, in spite of the best intentions, direct vision may not be as accurate as you think it would be. Um, but angiogram shows this very clearly. So the disadvantage is that you, you cannot visualize the landmarks as well without fluoroscopy. Uh, if it's a proximal stenosis, you can probably do it, but if it's distal, it's very hard to see. So another case, this actually, we did this a, a, a month ago. Um, uh, so you see how this patient has a shunt. Uh, there's a stenosis in the MPA here, and the surgeon said, I, I need space to put the Fontan eventually, so let's make sure that we get it to the upper lobe but not pass it, and we'll put that stent to prepare this patient. So we did that, you see how the, the sheath is put in, the wires in again, you see the stent going in through using the fluoroscopy, and we take pictures before we actually put the stent. Here's the edge of the stent, trying to make sure we don't uh, jail the upper lobe, and the balloon is being inflated, and then this is what it, and we actually pulled out the balloon and the stent at that point, and this is what it looks like afterwards. Now, it's interesting, sometimes the picture is showing the uh, RPA here. So of course you want the picture here. So one of the techniques the surgeons have figured out is just, why don't I just put a clamp on the RPA? Now you're forcing the blood to go the other side. So by doing that, you can actually create more flow to the side you want to see. So he just basically clamped it as we took the picture and you see how you can see, push this out here. So he said, I want this to be where the Fontan baffle comes in. So again, you can preci precisely position that stent. So this is the kid had a, has a Glenn, and you see that there is a, now a, a residual stenosis. At first, I thought that he's going to use this to put his Fontan in. But at the time of the surgery, he said, you know what? There's a very dilated aorta here. I would have to do a transection of the aorta to get to that. So it may be better we should put a stent in at this time. So he called me to the cath lab, and we went to the second stage. We ballooned that back up. And again, it's not good enough, right? He says that this is where the ascending order is going to sit, and he didn't want to transect it at this time. So we basically um, went and put a sheath in into the proximal RPA, took a picture. Um, we put a stent in, ballooned it up, and here's the, actually, here's a stent that we position. Again, this is the wash off on the Glen. We can present, pre precisely position this. And this is at the end, the edge of the stents right here, see the glens here. He said he's gonna put it right under here because of the dilated aorta, which is fine. This is a decision he wants to make and we can work together to precisely position the stent wherever he, uh, the surgeon wants so that he can help his own surgical feel for the Fontan. So you can see how that can be very helpful. Here's another case we did literally uh, within this past month. So we were told this 13 month old with allergies had a large PDA and did not have branch stenosis. I'm gonna go back and show you that. So you see how on the echo, here's the pulmonary valve, very proximal PAs, here's the ductus flow. So again, we were told that there's no proximal branch stenosis. So we took the kid to the cath lab to close the ductus. So here's a very unusual ductus, but look at the front part. So the proximal PAs were nice and large, but of course the echo could not see the distal pulmonary arteries. This thing is very tight. In fact, this picture, the shot here in the MPA, there's a right to left shunt going down the order. So this is not as um, big of a PA as we thought. 
So at this point in time, we aborted the PDA like our closure because I didn't want the RV pressure to be super systemic. We talked to the surgeon and we said, let's come up with another plan. Maybe we should do this as a hybrid. So again, we planned this out. So the plan was to put stents in the pul pulmonary arteries and then the surgeon can ligate the ductus since the, there was a stenotomy already. So how do you manage this? Well, that was what we did. We collaborated with the surgeons, came up with a hybrid procedure. Um, so here's the measurement. The RP, uh, RPA measured 1.89 millimeters here. The LPA measured 2.15. Again, for a three-month-old baby, this is quite small. So here we are. The chest is open. We took a picture in the MPA. Again, I want to point out to you how tight this is, but again, there's bidirectional shunting here. So again, trying to close the PDA without fixing the PAs are going to be a problem for the right ventricle. So uh, that we actually uh, came in and uh, did an initial angioplasty first because I want to make sure that it wasn't a high resistance tissue. Uh, uh, so here's the stent going in. Um, in fact, we inflated the balloon and that looks really good. And we were very happy with it. Now the problem here is I actually want to show you some of the problems that you can still encounter. You see, we put a short sheath in uh, thinking that it'd be easy to pull out the stent because it's such a short distance, there's no uh, curves to it. Now watch what happens. So what's the error here? Can you see what was happening here? I had a lot hard time removing the balloon. I just, well, at least I, I was very feeling the resistance. I didn't pull very hard. Can you guys see what the, where the problem is? Well, if you use the clamp as the uh, ref reference, you notice that the stent has proximally pulled back during the attempt to pull the balloon out. This is why I think it's important to have a long sheath to protect your stent when you pull out the balloon. So this is an error on my part of not using the stent long enough to get into where I want. So what is the solution for this? Well, here's the edge of the stent, of the sheath, and trying to pull this, the stent kept moving back. So I know that this is gonna be a problem. Um, well, the way to handle this is that um, I took the sheath and pulled it to one side. So the edge of the stent um, was holding the stent and then with that, the stent cannot move back anymore. And with that, you can able to pull the balloon out. So again, you have to think creatively in the operating room sometime. But I think that we could have avoided this if we used a longer sheath to allow you to be able to hold the stent in place so that you don't have to shift the stent when you withdraw the balloon. So I think that using a, sh a short sheath can be a problem when you're doing this type of a short um, closed procedure. In a direct open procedure, you can always reposition it because the surgeon is going to push it right back in. Uh, but in a closed procedure, you, your, your techniques have to be just as precise as in the cath lab. So this is where I made an error. So of course, we take the picture. We did actually was able to avoid the upper lobe here. But again, you see how that we're now maybe possibly jailing some of the RPA. So in fact, we got a, we have further dilated this and then we went ahead and see how it's not in the best position, but it's still okay. And here we are pulling the balloon out, a wire out. And now, now we are putting a catheter through the other side. And we, uh, you can see how the edge of the stent is very uh, much touching the, 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 the proximal LPA stent. And now we're putting the sheath in. It's actually touching the, the top part. And it, we had to be very careful as we are advancing the sheath to protect it. This time we were smart. We used a longer sheath to, to avoid the, the, the problem. And so here, this, the dilator's in. You can see how it jumps once the sheath is crossed. And we're able to put the stent in. And now we're getting this up. So now you have bilateral stent, uh, stents put in. This is a little more proximal than we, than we like, but still, I think it's OK. Um, notice now, when you take this picture, you see there's no more flow down the order. So the right pressures are lower so that you don't have the right to left shunting here. At this point in time, we felt very confident that we can close the ductus. Uh, so the surgeons went ahead and just clipped the, the ductus in the cath lab. And so this is what we got before and after. So of course, um, the patient did well for three days, had a, some sort of a decompensation event, and they did CPR. And this is one of the problems when you don't have, when you do early CPR, get, look what happens on the x-ray. I, I told them to take a lateral x-ray. You see what the problem is? That LPA stent shifted back. So now this is further back than you think. In fact, here's the x-ray showing the stent sitting. Now it has not touching the pulmonary valve even though it looks like this, um, but this is gonna be a problem when you go back here. So we're gonna have to be very creative. This kid is actually scheduled for the cath lab in two weeks. So again, the error here was do not use a long sheath like the way we normally would use in the cath lab without surgery. So I think that if you do the closed system, you have to be very precise and treat it like as if you're in the cath lab, making sure your stent is protected when you pull the balloon out with the long sheath.
So again, one of the other advantages of intraoperative stenting is that when you do these kissing stents, the surgeons can fold the stents back so that you can create a single opening so that l later on you can go back and do further interventions. So that, that's another advantage. You can't, we can't flare it and cap that, but the surgeons can do that in the operating room. So let's go to the coarctation. See how this is a kid who's going for a glen. And at this point in time, we said, if you're going to open up chest and you don't want to cut into the aorta again, why don't we just put the stent in? The surgeons put a little purse string and put a sheath into the, ace, uh, the transverse arch, take a picture, and then basically put the stent in right there. Um, the heart is beating, not on bypass. You see how we can impl implant this in. Here's the waist of the coarct site. And then this is the picture afterwards. So you see how uh, before and after. And with this, the surge, we stop. The surge, purse string is re uh, closed up the, the sheath side. And then the patient go ahead, get his glen done. This also happens at the time of the Fontan. So the patient, the, another patient who has a, a re here, and this is before the Fontan is actually completed, but we can do this with while the chest is open, put your sheath into the uh, aorta. Uh, from the ascending order or the transverse arch and put a stent in. So again, we don't do this a lot for our, our coarctations, but in this scenario where the patient has to go have more operations, uh, this is another advantage you can use by get open, getting to the coarct sites. Again, you can see the before and after picture. So let's talk about VST enlargement. Now again, this is a little bit unusual, very rare, but when it happens, you can actually benefit from using uh, intraoperative stents. This is a four-year-old girl, had transposition, had a large metric VST, came from another institution. At that time, they thought that because of a very abnormal single coronary, that she was not uh, suitable for a switch. Now this is not from our institution. They did a septectomy, did a PA band, and then they went ahead and put a glen in. And then the patient showed up at our hospital, and at that time, we said, let's see whether we can convert him back to a two ventricle repair. Here's the picture of this. Look at the heart, LV, not squeezing very well. In fact, the VSD, which was very big at first, has become very small. So very restrictive. The LV, the band is over here, and of course the VSD is not big enough because it got smaller. So very unusual situation, and there was a lot of discussion about what to do. You know, bad function, you really don't want to put them on bypass if you can avoid it. And here's the RV today order. Um, again, I don't think that you know, these days, the mo most centers would have just did the switch early on. See, the RV septum I mean, is compressing the, uh, uh, pushing towards the RV. So, um, the options at the time of our discussion with our surgeons that they can try to um, uh, just convert them to a Fontan, but with the bad function at this time, everybody was a little worried. Or they could um, try to enlarge the VSD to create the, the egress of that blood. Uh, Duodamus at that point. Uh, transplant, and then of course, um, all of these have high surgical risk at this time, and so we, the surgeons and us had just said, maybe this, in this case, let's try to just open up the stent and get more flow through that. So we took some MRIs, we actually made a lot of measuring. The septum length was about 12, uh, eight to 12 millimeters, again, very short. So basically, we actually uh, uh, tailored the stent to make it fit the septum. Here's the echo showing the, the uh, VSD. Uh, all surgeon, and his, just a tiny VSD at this point in time. So again, this is a, the surgeon put the RV free wall, put a needle in. You can see how we put the sheath in, and the wire is crossing the the, the 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 VSD. In fact, I'm not even so sure we went through the original VSD, or he just put a, a, a needle through the septum uh, near the VSD. But you can see uh, the picture from the LV gram. You see the contrast from the ex on the echo, and you can see the stent coming through. Uh, we can position this very precisely. Uh, see, here's the contrast showing that the stent is too far into the RV. In fact, here's the time where we're arguing with the surgeons where the positioning should be. And I said, finally, at this point in time, we kept pulling back, and clearly you see the septum here. So I think everybody was convinced that this is a good place to implant that stent. You notice that there's not a lot of flow through this right now, so I think that this is actually not a, the original VSD, this was a puncture into a, this, just a septum. So we're inflating the stent uh, on the VSD, and this is the flow now. This is no longer as restrictive as we had thought. Um, so here's the stent in the VSD, here's the flow through that. And in fact, I want to po point out to you that LV function was actually much better now. See how the squeeze of this RV is now much better than once the VSD has opened up the flow. So here's the VSD and the flow. 
And this is um, not, not very nice pictures here. We had an iPhone here. Uh, so, but you can see that we're working together and trying to figure out how to position ourselves. Here is a stent at the VSD. The patient was weaned off the inotropes right after surgery, extubated, and the echo showed pretty much uh, right after a good function afterwards. So here's the serial x-ray showing some improvement in the size of the heart afterwards. And it was discharged on day 11. Uh, this is what it looks like on the discharge uh, echo. You see there, and here's the flow through that. So again, this was a very good example of uh, how when you have unusual cases, you can collaborate and really come up with a good idea where surgery alone may be high risk, cath alone may be high risk, so let's combine it. So let me just summarize that intraoperative stenting, uh, either by direct visualization on bypass or by vascular puncture on aided by fluoroscopy off bypass is safe, it's effective, it's a good alternative to percutaneous approach uh, in the selected patients. The intraoperative andrograms are beneficial for intraoperative stenting and offer immediate and rapid evaluation of your procedure. A collaborative spirit, coordinated planning between the surgeon and the images is essential to optimize that both combined surgical and catheter-based interventions in congenital heart disease. There's advantages with intraoperative techniques that are distinct from the traditional solo catheter procedure or the surgical procedures with unusual difficult cases, uh, it's important to collaborate with the, all the services, and we can think outside the box when that happens. So constantly reevaluate and follow up our non-traditional treatment strategies, and we need to share our experience. Thank you for your attention.